Four. Happy Palm Sunday. How you guys doing? It is good to be with you. Is anyone else turning 45 years old today? Tom Kuiper is. Give it up for Tom Kuiper. Happy birthday. How, how old are you really? 46. Yeah, 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 yeah. Happy birthday to you. How come you guys don't sing like that during worship? Come on. What is going they do, on? They do. They I do. I hear it. They okay. Do. They do. What else is going we on? We have the picnic today. Who's coming? Everyone's coming. We're Every so excited. No one over here is coming. Not one person raised their hand. It's Try free it food. Who's coming to the picnic? There we go. Everyone's Maybe coming to the picnic. one more person. No, for real. Like, we need you to come. We bought a lot of food. So make sure you're there. Bring your chairs and tables. Greg what Barron is barbecuing what? Pulled pork, burgers, hot dogs. Yep. It's going to be so fun. Hey, let me pray over our, our morning and this time and pray for you guys. Would you stand with me? Uh, we're going we're gonna to worship together. Hey, you wore your Palm Sunday shirt. Are these? <laughs> Not really. Right? Kind of. little palm leaves. Let me pray. <laughs> Lord Jesus, we thank you for laughter and we thank you for community and we thank you for you. This is the day that for the joy set before you, you rode to the cross. And so uh, we stand here worshiping your name, declaring your faithfulness, declaring your faithfulness to the call on your life. And uh, we give you this worship and praise because you are worthy. You alone are worthy. And we love you and we give you our lives. And uh, we thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 One thing I love to do is to declare uh, some of the foundational things of what we believe. And uh, some of those things, uh, many of those things are found in the Apostles' Creed. And this uh, statement was written thousands of years ago uh, by church leaders that said, what, what do we really, what, do, what are we going to hold true for all of us in the church? So let's declare this together. This is the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I believe you gave sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life I believe there were wonders and signs You're still the same I believe every word that you say I believe there are scars in your hands That your goodness is good without end Your name change I will tell of your wonders and sing of your grace the God of creation who knows me by name the Lord is faithful yesterday now and always always your mercy is mighty age after age and all generations bow down and praise the Lord is faithful yesterday now and always I believe you will 
come in the clouds. I believe you are here even now. In your presence, I know there is power, power to save. Oh, I will tell of your wonders, sing of your grace. The God of creation knows me by name. The Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always. Always. Your mercy is mighty. And all generations will bow down and praise the Lord is faithful yesterday, now, and always. You were. knows me by name the Lord is faithful yesterday now and always always your mercy is mighty age after age all generations bow down and praise the Lord is faithful yesterday now and always sing your word you were
you get shy on me, lift up your song. You gotta lie it in. Come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. You got a lion inside of those lungs, get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul, don't you get shy. Jesus. Thank you for your lordship over our lives, the salvation you offer, the life that you give. All praise, glory to you, Lord. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, guys. Good morning, Open Door Fellowship. Happy Palm Sunday. My name is Caleb Lynch, lead pastor here at Open Door Fellowship. Uh, it's good to be with you. All right, we got some things going on I want you to be a part of. The first thing that's coming up right away is today, our Palm Sunday picnic after second hour. Come out, bring your chairs, bring your blankets. We've got food for you, and we're just all gonna be together for a little while. There'll be Easter egg hunt. Um, it'll be a great time, so come and join us. Don't miss out on that. And then Friday night, Friday night is our Good Friday service, six o'clock right here in the auditorium. Uh, it'll be about an hour long. 
We've got a sweet evening prepared and we don't want you to miss it. And then that next Sunday morning is Easter Sunday and it is a great day. We're gonna be together, we're gonna celebrate the resurrection and we're gonna get to see a few baptisms. So um, if, if you're wanting to get baptized though, uh, you gotta get signed up and you gotta get signed up right away. And then I also wanna encourage you um, to go to our baptism class. Um, and so that's right now during our second hour. So if you're here in first hour right now, make sure in, after service you get over there during second hour. It's gonna be in B1 in our conference room, but it's just a class for anyone that wants to learn about the process of baptism and what we do and how we do it and what we believe about it. So go check that out. Even if you're just interested, uh, you wanna make sure to get in there today. All right, next up, you've been hearing a lot about it. We got our rummage sale coming. And our rummage sale, we've got a lot of the pieces of it already taken care of. We've got all the volunteers to run it from the Friday through the Sunday, but we do need some, uh, some people to sign up for the prep, for the front end volunteering to help us get it set up and get it organized. And then we still are accepting donations. There's only a couple more opportunities to do so. So make sure you connect with Tom Allen in the courtyard, go on our website to learn more about that. We're super excited that this is gonna to get to bless our high schoolers, junior highers, and kids as they go to camp this summer. All right, this is another opportunity you don't wanna miss out on. It's one of the best things we do here at Open Door. We are having another session of the living room with Tom and Marcia Kuyper, uh, kind of a marriage enrichment thing going on. Um, many in our, our body have done it. If you're a married couple and you haven't got a chance to go through this living room, there are four slots still available, but they do go quick. This is our first time announcing it, so they will fly, uh, but go sign up for those online. And we'd love you to get to be a part of that. Okay, you, uh, you, might, you might know about some of our adult classes that we offer during second hour. There's one called The Journey, and on April 22nd, they're inviting anyone that wants to be a part of it. They can only take about 40, so it's kind of a first come, first serve type of thing. But they're doing a pizza party, including Bunko, so they're calling it Pizzeria Bianco. You get where we're going there? But 40 people, you can show up. It's gonna be on April 22nd at the Marshall's house but you gotta go online to kind of get registered for that because they're taking some payment to pay for the pizza and all that good stuff. So don't miss out on that. It'll be a great time to meet new people and, and have some community and eat some good pizza and maybe win some good prizes. So check that out on our website. We hope you get to be a part of that. That's all we got today. I hope you have a fantastic Palm Sunday. I can't wait to have a picnic with you guys. We'll see you soon. Love you. Have a great day. Peace. Hey, good morning. Happy Palm Sunday. Who can say palm like an Aussie? Oh, that was awesome, actually. Wow. Well done. You just got to pretend like the L isn't there and just palm, palm Sunday. Hey, I'm excited to be here with you guys this morning, but I just wanted to say thank you to Kibby Quinn. We had Kibby Quinn on the keys this morning. And... Um, we love, love, loved seeing you up there, Kivy, and thank you for playing piano. It was amazing. So uh, it's Palm Sunday, and uh, it's, it's a week out from, from Easter. It's a week out from the cross. And um, I was thinking about this, this reality that I think sometimes we get a little backwards, and I think sometimes we, we think that Christmas is the pinnacle of the year, the, the pinnacle of our faith, the, the best part. Maybe it's the food, maybe it's the presence. Um, but I think it's important to be reminded today that really the cross is the pinnacle moment. Because if the cross and the resurrection didn't happen, then there's no point celebrating Christmas. And I, I was thinking about this, and we spend all these weeks leading up to Christmas, and it's great, and we should keep doing that. But... but um, these are the weeks leading up to Easter. And uh, today, Palm Sunday, it marks this moment in history where the king of kings was ushered into town. And I want to, uh, I want to spend our time this morning, um, my hope is that we could retell some of maybe what led up to this moment in history. And my hope is that, uh, that you guys could find yourself really placing yourself in that moment. Um, and it would be real to you that, that this story of a donkey and of palm branches wouldn't just be something you've heard many times before, but that it would do something real in your heart. And I, I ask that you would allow the Spirit to do that in you this morning. Does that sound okay? 
So let's, let's do it. And I'm actually talking about Christmas. I'm going to start this morning reading a verse um, that we're probably more used to hearing at Christmas. But I think the angel that, that speaks these words over Mary, he says something about who Jesus is that I think is going to be really important for us to remember as we get to the moment that he rides into town. But my hope is that this would be this kind of bird's eye view through the Gospels, through the life of Christ, um, as as we sit here on this Palm Sunday and remember the true king riding into town on a donkey, being hailed as the long awaited Savior and Messiah. See, 2,000 years ago, um, God became flesh and dwelt among us. We know that. And uh, a king was born that day. Not just any king, but the true king of kings was born, fully God, fully man. And before the day of his birth, the angel Gabriel spoke to Jesus' mother Mary and he said these words. We've got that on the slide. He said this to Mary, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. I hope those words of uh, kingship, of a throne, of reign, I hope they stand out to you and stay present in your mind as we continue on. But Jesus was born, and he grew, and there were only a few in, in those early days that truly knew who he was, that truly knew uh, what he had come to do what he had come to accomplish. We don't, we don't know a ton of what happened in those formative years of Jesus' life, but what we see in the Gospels is that about 30 years went by and all of a sudden Jesus begins his earthly ministry and we begin to get glimpses of who this Jesus is. We start to see that he's the son of the living God. He's the son of man. He's the fulfillment of scripture. He's the anointed one, the proclaimer of good news, the bondage breaker, the great physician, the bringer of the kingdom of God. And we see clearly in the way that Jesus uh, goes about this mission that he has on earth to seek and save the lost. There's no doubt that the heart of Christ is that every single person would come to know the reality of who he is. There's, there's not a question that that was his heart. And yet while that's true, what we see as we begin to see this life of Christ unfolding in those three years of his ministry is that there's also this tension that he carries. And the tension is a tension of timing. See, there's this tension between Jesus wanting every single person he encounters to see, this is who I am. But there's also a tension between, it's not yet my time. And he knows, Jesus knew that he came to this earth with a mission of salvation. He knew that it would result in his death. And actually, it was his death and his resulting resurrection That was the very reason that he came in the first place. And he knew that what would lead to this death would be an uproar of these religious leaders, these phony Pharisees, these people uh, pretending, and that they would be afraid that they would lose their power. Jesus knew as he was going about his mission that there would be this tension between um, what went out about who he was And how quickly it spread like wildfire. And at the very same time that all would come to know who he was. But he was faithful, he was faithful, he was faithful. And we start to see these moments cropping up through the ministry of Jesus. Where he knows that if word got out of who he was, that it would impede the timing of what he'd come to accomplish. And so he's caring for it. He's caring for it in this really careful way. And you remember at the wedding at Cana, it was Jesus' first public ministry. And you see how he carries this tension of timing when he says to his mother, my hour has not yet come. 
And in Luke 40, verses 40 to 41, it's this incredible story of one of the many moments that Jesus healed all those that came to him. And scripture talks about how multitudes of people came to him and he healed every one of them and he was casting out demons. And verse 40 and 41 talks about how this demon had been cast out and the demon itself proclaimed these words. He said, you are the son of God. But Jesus rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. And he knew that it wasn't yet his time. You remember the moment that Jesus healed the leper, and the leper was ready to go and tell the whole world that this is who Jesus is, but Jesus says, tell no one. Just go to the priest and tell him that you've been made well. You remember the time when Jairus' daughter had died, And Jesus was late because the woman touched his garment and he healed her on the way. And Jairus' daughter is dead and Jesus goes in there and he heals her. He raises her from the dead and he charges everyone in that room, do not tell a soul because it's not yet my time. You remember when Peter had been asked by Jesus, who do you say that I am? And when Peter's response was, you are the Christ of God, Jesus said, don't tell anyone that because it's not yet my time. And Jesus' response in that moment was this. He says, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. But it's not yet that time. And after Jesus had been transfigured, that moment on the mountain where his glory was unveiled and he's standing there with Moses and Elijah. And after having witnessed these things, Peter, James and John told no one the things that they had seen in that time because it wasn't yet his time. And yet all the while, while this was happening and Jesus continued to reveal, to reveal, this is who I am. This is what I've come to do. This is how much you need me. The tension was building between come and see that I am here. Come and see who I am. And yet don't let it get out like that quite just yet. And the tension was building. And you remember last week that Jesus, as the tension continues to build, he raises his friend Lazarus from the dead. And people are starting to go crazy. People are starting to believe. More and more are starting to believe. I I think this guy's the one. I think this is the person we've been waiting for. He literally just rose this guy from the dead. He was starting to stink in there. I think he's the one we've been waiting for. And multitudes start to follow him. Sometimes he sneaks away and they don't know where he is, but they're looking. They're trying to fight him because they're starting to believe and hope is rising. I think this is the one we've been waiting for. But while there were those who believed and while belief and hope was growing, there were also those that told the Pharisees. And see, this is what happened. It got to a point where the word about the word couldn't be contained. And it was explosive. So you can't contain the goodness and the faithfulness and the reality when Jesus, King, Savior, Messiah shows up on the scene. It can't be held back. And the Pharisees... In the wake of Lazarus being raised from the dead, they're pulling their hair out. They are not pleased about what is happening here. And they begin this plot to kill Jesus. They say, what are we to do? He's performed many signs. They can see it. They're not denying it. They can actually see the way he has fulfilled scripture. Just think about that for a moment. Here they are coming up with how they're going to kill the very one who is fulfilling all that they had hoped for. How are we going to kill him? But here's what happens. When hardness of heart and hunger for power and self-righteousness creep in, it leads to denial. See, denial is living blatantly facing the other way. From obvious truth. They plot to kill Jesus. And in John 11.54. It says that Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews. But he went from there to the region near the wilderness. To a town called Ephraim. And there he stayed 
with the disciples. And the disciples had seen this before, this kind of like sneaking off, um, this avoiding of the re- religious leaders, um, this kind of keeping the truths of who he is and was on the DL, on the down low. They, they had seen this before. Okay, Jesus is kind of pulling the, the back road trick again. We, we've seen this before. But little did they know that this was the last moment that Jesus could say, it is not yet my time. This was the last moment that Jesus chose to take the back road. (laughs) Passover was approaching only a week out. And every Jew and God-fearer from every region around Jerusalem began to stir and pack their bags and make the pilgrimage to the great feast that they would look forward to every year. This feast where they would remember that first Passover in Egypt, where the God that they worshipped saved all those who had painted the blood of the lamb above their doorpost. And they came to remember the saving power of God who passed over when he saw the blood of the lamb. And in just one week's time, had they have known the true lamb of God that all had been pointing to would have his blood shed and he'd be nailed to a cross. And the shed blood of that lamb would be so powerful that it would be enough to cleanse from all sin and give life eternal. And now... That last moment in the back roads, that moment had come. Now his time had come. And we remember at this Palm Sunday, the moment that the time of Jesus to withhold the fullness of who he is from all who could hear it and see it, the time had come. And I can just imagine him, I'm taking a little bit of liberty here, but in my mind I imagine Jesus in that last moment in the back roads, away from the the religious leaders and the hustle and bustle saying, come on, boys, gather around. Come on. It's time. And I don't think they fully grasped what he meant. But it's time. I'm going to take the main road. I'm going to take the main road. And and I wonder if they might have been like, we can't take the main road, Jesus. Jesus. There's people that are out to get you. We won't let that happen. I won't stand for it. There's people that want to kill you, Jesus. I know. Will you trust me? Yes, Lord. Okay, you two, come over here. I I want you to go down there into that village and I want you to get me a donkey. Now, we hear that and we're like, what on earth? But I can guarantee you this. When they heard the words, I want you to get me a donkey, and not just a donkey, but the cult of a donkey, I can guarantee you that in that moment they knew what he was saying is that I'm about to fulfill a prophecy from Zechariah that every single Jew and his son and his family have known since they were kids The prophecy that declares the long-awaited king riding into town to declare, I come with peace, I come with salvation, I come as the king who has been prophesied for since the very beginning. They knew in the moment he said, go and get me the colt of that donkey. He's going to do it. This is the moment we've been waiting for. He's about to tell the whole world and anyone who can listen that I'm here. He's not going to hold back anymore. We don't have to hide anymore. He's going to do it. Let's go. Let's go. The king is here. Whoa. In Luke 19, verse 29, says, When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you. Where in entering you'll find a colt on which no one has ever sat. Untie it. Bring it here. If anyone asks you you, why are you untying it, you shall say, the Lord has need of it. (laughs) Kind of imagine like that Star Wars thing where he's like, you know, like, like, turn the other way. And they just do. (laughs) So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying it, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. (laughs) And that was good enough. (laughs) But listen to the words of this prophecy that was just 
burned into their mind. This is in Zechariah 9.9. Let's put that up. I think we've got it there. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous, having salvation is he. Humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. There is not a doubt in my mind that these words were absolutely burned into their brain. As he says, go and get me the colt of a donkey. Oh my goodness, here we go. Rally the people, it's about to go down. In verse 35, this is Luke 19, let's keep going. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it, and as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road, kind of like rolling the red carpet out. Already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. I would have loved to have been in that crowd that day. And in John's gospel, he adds that the crowd were also yelling, Hosanna! Hosanna! They couldn't contain themselves. They were bursting at the seams. In verse 39, let's keep going in this passage here. It says, and some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I love this verse. He said, I tell you, if these were silent, even the stones would cry out. Wow. No more slipping away. No more staying silent. Jesus' time had come. This was the moment that Jesus' time had come. All creation, Scripture tells us, had been groaning for this moment for the long-awaited king to ride into town. And it's as though Jesus is saying to the Pharisees in this moment, as they're so upset at the way the crowd's honoring the king, it's as though he's saying, even if I shut the mouths of every person in this crowd right now, so deserving, so worthy, so incredible, so marvelous is this moment that all creation itself wouldn't even be able to contain itself at the rightness of this moment. (laughs) The King of Kings is here. This is Jesus. This is the Savior of the world. This is the one who was worshipped at his birth and of whom was declared peace among those with whom he is pleased. And in this moment, He arrives into town sitting on a donkey, which is a symbol of peace, riding upon palm leaves, which are a symbol of peace. And he arrives ushering in a new way of peace because he is the true king of peace. And the one that the angel Gabriel had told Mary about that we read in the very beginning, this son of the most high, he would be that prophesied son of David that would take the throne. And here he is. The kingdom of God that he would bring would be different than any kingdom that had ever been before it. A kingdom as it was meant to be where Jesus reigns, where man is reconciled back to God, and where those who were dead are made alive. This Jesus on this day, this Palm Sunday that we remember today, was riding into town, making it abundantly clear, I am here and I am the king. (laughs) But here's the crazy part. It was true that there were those who saw Jesus for who he truly was. It is true that there were those who by faith saw him as the Christ and believed upon his name. Truly believed in him. But it's likely, and I think it would be fair to say, that most of the frenzied cries of Hosanna from that crowd of people were motivated more out of a desperate longing to be saved from their current circumstances, to be set free from their Roman oppressors, than they were out of a recognition of who Jesus really was and is. But I want us to realize this. The triumphal entry of Christ, which is what most of our Bibles title this moment as, it wasn't a king who came to conquer the latest power. It was a king who came to conquer the greatest power. And you can tweet that later if you'd like to. (laughs) 
(laughs) And I think we still do this today, more consumed by what's hard right now than we're willing to slow down and realize that the reality of sin and darkness and evil is far more great than whatever our suffering may be in this moment. And it is not at all that Jesus doesn't care. But in fact, it is the very opposite, that he cares so much that he came to conquer the greatest oppressor, (laughs) which is our sin, which is death, which is darkness. See, they longed for rest and peace rightfully. But they longed for it in the immediate. But little did they know that what Christ had come to accomplish would actually bring about rest and peace that would transcend circumstances. Can you believe that? That the rest and peace that Jesus brings actually invades our circumstances so that the current moment actually doesn't have power over the goodness of his rest, over the power of his peace. And that this rest and peace that Christ would bring would actually be an everlasting rest and peace. And the reason it would be everlasting is because their source would be in him. We often think of this word, Hosanna, um, kind of similar to hallelujah. We often think of it as a a sort of a declaration of praise. And I think over time it, it definitely can be used that way. But when you look at the root of the Hebrew, it's actually two Hebrew words joined together. And... uh, It's the Hebrew word yasha, which means deliver or save, and ana, which which means beg or beseech. So you put these uh, words together and what the crowds were crying out was actually, I beg you to save us. Please deliver us. It puts a little different spin on it. Absolutely, there was was, um, worship and adoration and praise and celebration, no doubt. But mixed into it was an utter plea for deliverance. In the short days that would follow this moment, Jesus would be arrested by the Pharisees. He'd be uh, beaten and mocked. And uh, they'd be so outraged by his claims to be the Christ, to be God himself. Which couldn't have been more true, should I add that they rallied their people. And not only did these religious leaders so appalled at the statements of Christ actually just claiming to be who he was, not only did they rally their people, they rallied the very people that they were trying to be set free from. How backwards can we be sometimes? This man should be put to death, they thought. How could it be that the cries of the multitude could go from Hosanna to crucify him in days? How could that be possible? It can be easy for us to to retell this story and separate ourselves from the accusers. But I wonder if we could slow down and realize the depravity of what we've been saved from for long enough to recognize that we can all be that fickle at times. Hosanna to crucify him in a matter of days. And then the Son of Man was killed on a cross. And for those who had hope, it seemed like hope was just melting away. But we serve a God who has heard the Hosannas of his people. Let me say that again. We serve a God who has heard the hosannas of his people. We serve a God who has heard our cry. I beg you to save us. I beg you to deliver us. And not only has he heard you, not only has he listened, he he has responded. See, they thought they'd won when they put the Son of Man to death. But his death was his victory. His death was the very direction the donkey was heading. He knew it. That's what he came for. The people cried, please deliver us. 
save us. Set us free. We can't imagine how we could go on unless you save us from this moment, from this hardship. And as Jesus hung on the cross with his nailed, pierced hands and feet and blood running down the beams of that cross, much like it did all those years ago on the beams of that lentil, he still heard the cries of his people cries of deliverance, cries of saving. And with a final breath, he has responded and he has said, it's finished. I hear you. And it's the very reason that I came in the first place. I came to deliver. I came to save. And the thing that has made you feel as though all hope is lost is the very thing that has brought the hope of the world into your life. I have heard you. I have come. See, the triumphant king triumphed over sin and death for you, for me. And next Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we remember that the triumphant king has also triumphed over the grave bringing his resurrection life to all who would trust in him. How good is that? Can you feel yourself sucked into the story just for a little bit this morning? Can you imagine the, these moments? I, I pray that the Lord would do a work in our hearts, a work of anticipation, a work of recognition, a work of remembering, and that it would simply cause us to respond in worship. And so we're going to move into a time of communion now, as we do each Sunday. And uh, let's, let's take this so um, rem remembering these moments that have been burned into our mind this morning of the triumphant king who came with a purpose, who came with direction, who knew the time, and when the time came, he went to the cross for you and for me. And if it wasn't for the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, and if it wasn't for the, for the fact that he's risen from the grave, we might as well not be here. Might as well go and find a country club. But in fact, he did. He did go all the way to the cross for you and for me. He has overcome the power of sin and death. He has won. His shed blood was enough. He has washed you clean and he has risen again so that you are risen and I and we are alive. And so let's take this communion and let's continue to worship the true King of Kings this morning. are ready, you're welcome to go to, we have tables throughout the room, in the corners of the room, you're welcome to partake the uh, communion emblems when you're ready. Also, we have folks from our prayer team, I know Doug uh, will be by the uh, exit sign over there, would love to pray with you. But not only that, you guys, you're welcome to uh, go pray for each other, minister to each other. It's our time just to respond to what we've heard this morning, and just to kind of be ministers to one another.
You chose the road that led to suffering Nothing was spared to prove your love for me You're the mystery And your final breath became eternity What we had lost forever you redeemed Hosanna, Hosanna In the highest forever Hosanna Triumphant King, the Lamb who was slain, who rose in majesty. There's never a heart beyond your victory. Oh, so you are the one that we are welcoming, Jesus.
lost our sin. Lost our sin. There is no name higher or greater. Your name, Jesus, means he will save us. And that is what we declare, Lord. 
you are our salvation. When they cried out, Hosanna, what they were truly crying for was you, the very name of salvation. And we thank you. That's who you are. That's what you've done. That's what you accomplished in our lives. And if there is anybody here who is asking that question, can I put my faith, can I put my trust in that? Will you just encourage their hearts and say yes, because I am the one that is faithful and true for all time, for all generations, from age to age. I was, I am, I will always be you, Lord Jesus. We praise you for that truth in our lives, God. Thank you for what you've done. All praise to you, Lord. And in your name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Let's declare our benediction together. This comes from 1 Timothy. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for worshiping with us. We'll see you at the uh, Palm Sunday picnic. Have a good one.